Today we're going to talk with George Borg and Art LaFromboise um, with just little bits of trivia about the plywood mill. Um, and I'm just saying plywood mill because you guys can say how many names it had. Because it was many different names, yeah. right? And could George start then telling us uh, who owned it to begin with? Okay, Bill Harris. Bill Harris built the mill with, along with Bill Locker. And Bill Locker come from Saskatchewan. They come from the mill in Saskatchewan. I don't know where Bill Harris, how he got in there, but he wound up the owner. And they ran it for a few years when I was there, and then it went bankrupt. Oh, it went bankrupt, bankrupt. while Harris had it? Yeah. Okay. And then? And then it was uh, a bunch of, uh, who was all in there? There was... Uh, Oh, it kind of was local people then, wasn't it? Yeah. That put money yeah, into Cannon, it. Yeah, the Cannon was one of them. John Zechner. Uh, who were the big guys there? Murray Atkinson. It was all the management then, and private people that owned it. Yeah, and then you could privately uh, uh, become part of shareholders. Yeah. And then what was so it I remember, called? I remember Bruno was back Multiply. then. Multiply. Bruno Grisanti. And then it was Multiply. Was I that Multiply or Nor Nor Pie? Or Nor Nor Pie? Nor Pie was when Atkinson owned it, or when uh, Bill Harris owned it. Okay. Oh, started out with Nor, Nor Pie, then went to Multiply. Yeah, or Hard Pie, or I don't remember. Exactly. I yeah, I remember Nor Pie. Okay, so when Harris first started it, then what kind of plywood were you making? Mostly just standard sheeting. Maybe four by four. Four by four. Four by four sheets of lots of three. Quarter inch three eighths. Eh? Three eighths, yeah. Tons of three eighths. And then it went then when these other guys went after the mill went down, that's when they started they brought in all these different other products of birch. And the higher grade uh, poplar. Yeah. Or the uh, higher grade uh, birch material. Grade. They tried all kinds of things. They tried <laughs> overlaying four by eight and before it went bankrupt to try to salvage the mill, they used to bring in by the train. All our plywood was shipped by train one time. And it come in and was shipped to somewhere else and distributed to different areas, I guess. And that was, they brought in, I remember unloading four by, four by eight sheets of veneer. It'd be all banged up. They tried to make something out of it, but it never worked out. So the the, uh, when when Harris had it, it was just poplar, was it? Yeah, yeah. plywood. Yeah, and except for that stuff they brought in to try and make. Oh, and tried to. Oh, okay. They okay. tried making their own four by eight out of. So the things I remember about that early plywood mill were that freaking burner out the back there. Yeah, that was yeah they burned serious. everything. Yeah, burned everything, everything in everything. those days. The sawdust would be all over town on a bad day. Yeah. <laughs> with the wind, eh? Yeah, we'd be well, blowing it all over. From Sanders and the trim saw, I guess, was sawdust. Right. And it blew into the bag, eh, in the barker room that time. Then it used to go on from the air belt out into the... But at first it was just straight out. Straight there was, out, there yeah, was nothing there out. that uh, even refined it or anything else. It was, yeah, it was just straight out. <laughs> that was it. It was so... Have you got a recollection in those early days where the wood would have come from? All different areas. It's basically around here, wasn't that? Because Buchanan had trucks in Red Rock. He was hauling from Red Rock. He had a five-ton truck and brochure. Okay. I don't know if you remember him. Brochure. Brochure. Yeah. Do you remember him? Who? Brochure. Brochure. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah. He yeah. he did a lot of the hauling. Oh okay. So I don't think it was much far from here. No. Here more no, probably. Yep. Yeah. Just anywhere local. where there was half decent poplar. Right. In those days, you could cut the best part of the poplar and just leave the rest. And but you couldn't do that in the later right. year. That's why they started running into lots of trouble with getting wood. Right. You had to get rid of the remainder of the, the tree. Yeah, the and then the chippers came in and, and they, yeah. that's where they started utilizing all the wood. So and so some of that pile down there used to be chips, right? As well as sawdust. Yeah. Yep. Well, chips were blown. Chips. chips went into a different, ran through the chipper and went out to a chip pile and they used to sell it to the mills. Oh, okay. And then uh, when Joe Bosch, uh, Joe Bosch and them actually made a, a, a packer to pack these things for, for, yeah. wood, uh, for wood burning stoves. Oh. And then it became into, into like long blocks, whatever else, for, for wood burning stoves. Uh, oh. they, we call them pellets, whatever else, but right. uh, that never went anywhere. I don't know why, because that was, to me, that was one of the better inventions. That yeah. Okay, so now. No, this was in the, this, 
the last part of the right. Part yeah. of it when but when there. did the hockey stick shafts come into? When uh, Atkinson and them, when all those part those owners all bought the mill. So this is Bruce Atkinson's dad, Murray yeah, Atkinson. Murray yeah. Atkinson. Right. Yep. And who is McMillan and Liddell on the mill? No, these guys owned it. Too. Yep, Multiply still owned yeah. it then. Yep. And the, the two biggest guys in there were Buchanan and Atkinson. And it was just the hockey shaft, right? Just the just shaft, shaft. yep. Yep. We sold to Sherwood. Uh, All Sherwood was the big one. Titan. Titan sold big time. Can Titan came tire? after the Sherwood, though, because yeah. Sherwood was Sherwood our, our, our original. Yeah, yeah. yeah, our original. And Titan took over. The others, they sold to, who was that in the States there? He's from Louisville. Louisville was, there was lots, stuff went to Quebec. Okay. We never got to go to Chuck went there. See how the stick was actually made, but and the shaft were made from poplar. No, birch and well, oh, birch, birch, yeah, birch yeah. Birch after a while, it became birch, birch poplar, and, poplar. And, yeah, because yeah. the, the birch were too, a little bit too heavy for because we oh. made them out of 19 ply, uh, yeah, norm, yeah. We started up with 19 ply, 19 eh? ply, yeah, yeah. Okay, explain to somebody what 19 ply is because there will be people watch this that won't know what you're saying. Okay, sheets of plywood were, uh, when you actually peel the log, it, it became like a veneer. So what we did was we made 19 plies of this stuff right here. And so our hockey shafts used to be about this, this thick as it, as it was. So just so you... So each uh, sheet of veneer was, was we called a ply. So it was actually 19 ply. And it was glued? It was all glued with, yeah, yeah. Some of the glues we were using was was pretty potent too. <laughs> I can imagine they back are then, yeah, well, yeah. Back then it was urea glue. Urea, yeah, yeah. The urea glue was the, the worst. It was, yeah. You didn't want to go down to the wet. What we called the dry end at the time. You didn't want to go down there if you were in the wet end because, whoa. <laughs> so was the glue applied by hand or was no, it a machine? Glue glue spreader. Yeah, we had a glue spreader that uh, that spread the glue. Wow. And then you obviously compacted it too. Yeah, and it went into the uh, pre-press to, to cold press it first, and then, then the heat press, uh, the hot press. Mm -hmm. And these were five foot by four foot panel or four foot by five foot panels. Yeah, uh, yeah, and then they get trimmed out and everything else, and then you'd have to go through a gang saw to to cut the actual individual sticks uh, six at a time, eh? Yeah, yeah. So the shaft would be sent away, and then those people would put their own brand name on it. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Well, just each, each player had their own their own way of getting a stick made. Oh, okay. So they'd go into wherever, whoever, Sherwood or Titan, or, and then tell them what they want and then try to make it for them. Yeah, because everybody had a specific uh, weight of, of the uh, shaft and specific mm -hmm. curve of their stick and, and everything else. So that would be a company somewhere else then that would uh, yeah. do the final yeah, part would, of would the Yeah, would do the modifying stick. of, of the, mm -hmm. the whole thing. And why do you think that didn't keep going? It uh, did. It did. Compost. Compost. Was it compost? Oh yeah, the composite blades the composite. came out. Yeah, the composite oh. with the fiberglass and uh, and uh, kind of, it was lighter, cheaper. Right. Not cheaper. It was more expensive. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. No. Yeah, but uh, weight-wise and everything else, it was we couldn't compete against it. That's that's exactly right. Well, Gretzky was one of the big pushers for stuff. Wayne Gretzky, he came on the aluminum shaft and. All those big star star guys, eh? Yeah. Hockey players. Yeah, because we even went to inserts. It was called uh, where we'd insert into the fiberglass uh, uh, shaft itself. So again, it was it was yeah. we downgraded into into part of that. And eventually, it got too expensive, and the birch was getting harder to get, and couldn't compete with all these other products. So like even our even our Curtis Curve was uh, was a mainstay for us for a while because Andy Moog was the the, yeah. the, the original uh, guy who goalie who actually because it was it was curved to a certain standard where it was easier to hold for him and I guess other goalies whatever else but he was our big one but and then uh, it had a curve on the very end so when you actually picked up your stick it was easier to pick it up even uh -huh. so it was almost like a ergonomic thing that uh, that came out even in hockey. Wow. So tell us a little bit about the Gleiss. The Gleiss started, I can remember that guy coming here from BC. It was in the 90, 80s. Somewhere there, yeah. yeah the we have, we had made the panel part. This part was all pre-made. Then it had to cool down. And then because of shrinkage and stuff, eh? 
then they come along and they started first time with just gluing it straight to the panel without, without anything else and that didn't pan out too good so they started heating the, the panel before they applied the glue by hand. They put it through the spreader but because of the you, this thing didn't have no give to it so they uh, started they had people rolling it and then they had to roll down to the also onto the glaze itself and then that was set aside till it dried for a while and then was then went through the press pre press so, so now you need to explain what glaze was what was it going to be used for a skating rink yeah Basically. these were these were made for skating rinks you could do one side for so many years and lift it over and do the other side for so many that's the idea of this plane here can be all taken apart. We cut all the panels at at work. It was all cut up. And which size were the sheets of glaze? Four by four? Two by four. Two by four. <laughs> two by four. Oh. Yeah. Two by yeah, we made them into they were originally made at four by four, but then we cut them back to no. two by four. And why we lost the contract is not nice to say, but because the, 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 the work quality was, was originally when we first started it was it was it was high because the fact is this was our, our big money maker. And, ridge, and then after a while it became a race to see who could make more glaze than, than the other shifts or whatever else. And then all of a sudden it was being cut off square, it was uh, delamming, it was, so again it was, if, I think if we would have kept the quality up the way we were, it would have been a mainstay for, for even the mill back then, but it became a big competition at whose who shift made more. And, but the thing is the process was so long that sometimes one shift would get the whole product ready for the next shift to, to, to make. So, so they never made any. So it was, it was sad to say that. But uh, so, can you remember where some of that was shipped to? Like, who actually used some of it? Brian Trotchy had a skating rink. He used that for because this is a lot harder to skate on once it's sprayed with silicone. It doesn't have. It's not as slick as ice. So he had that for his hockey schools for strengthening legs. And wow. Then one went to Ironbridge. One the went first. to Germany. That's that's the last one we made because yeah. it was all off square. And they shipped Austria, it all back. Right? And we shipped it all back to Vegas. Austria went to it. Is it Austria? Austria? Yeah, Austria and Germany. Well, I remember it was it was across across the ocean or whatever else. So it was very expensive to, to for a rink yeah, to be shipped all the way over there and then shipped all the way back because it was all off square and you had big cracks and so you couldn't. It was unusable. It was long <laughs> yes. quite a ways out. Two hundred feet. It was long ways off square. Yeah. <laughs> It's so, too bad that it never took off just to try well, a small also, ring it, here. It, it probably would have been banded anyway because of this, the glue. Oh, it's like inhaling yeah. what's that wood glue there. Just that same, they wound up smelling the same and the same reaction to human beings. It got you loaded. Oh, okay. Oh, the airplane glue. And <laughs> yeah, right. oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, like I said, once you heat it, it was like, wow. Wow. <laughs> I don't even think that fellow that brought this into the mill that even last long enough to see a skating rink, he passed away. Oh. So exactly what is the glaze made of? It's a plastic uh, composite of, basically a plastic, the way yeah, a real plastic. hard plastic, yeah. But you didn't make that. No, no. That, that part, no, that came no. here, you put it on the wood. And then on the bottom they have almost like a cloth so it absorbed the glue, so, so it actually would, would glue together. Because I think originally it was just plain plastic, plastic at the for time. A while, yeah, yeah and, and it, there was no, it always just came delamed or whatever else. So they put the cloth on and, and it actually worked really, really well. So was it an expensive product? Yeah. Yeah, we had to buy uh, special saws for, for what we call bullnosing uh, to make th these these grooves. We had to buy a special machine just to, so you could actually uh, make the, these grooves. And I just. can see what you mean when you say it's got to be right square. It's gotta be right oh, yeah, it, it had to be because if you're off like that, even that little wee bit there, then all of a sudden the, the whole rink was. And by the time you got to a, a certain spot, then the gaps were <laughs> were getting bigger and bigger. So it was just too bad. Yeah, an yeah. invention that really didn't go anywhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, but I, I mean, I don't know what happened to the mill, the skating rink they, in Ironbridge, They're just outside of Sudbury. Eh? Yeah, they sent one. They used it for a while. I don't know what happened to it after though. But you could use it year round for roller skating or anything. Yeah, I just as I remember that float in the fishing festival parade yep. with some on it and the kids skating. That's when Jack Stevenson's it. wife was here. <coughs> yeah. She was she was a figure skating woman. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. But I mean there's lots of people still have pieces of glass that's been used for many different oh, things. Yeah.
Yeah. Mine, I use mine, I have the cloth side up, and it's one of the best things for cleaning fish. Oh, is it? Yeah, it's because it it's, it, 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 the fish don't slide on, on that cloth, <laughs> and, and it's super, it's super, super strong. Doesn't the cloth come off? No, no, this stuff is, I don't know. I think it's kind of burnt It's right almost like a fiberglass, or, yeah. yeah, it's not a, like a true it cloth was, or whatever else. It's, we it's, tried pulling it apart, you couldn't get it apart. No, no, you can't take that cloth off that plastic guy. <laughs> Well, somehow and we ended up with a couple of sheets of that, and I think it was used for sliders oh, on yeah. a snow machine at oh, yeah. one time yeah. and the yeah. bottom of a sled yeah. because it was indestructible practically. Yeah. 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 So I don't know how long these things were supposed to last. I know they're guaranteed for so many years on one side, then they flip because they just shaved it, eh? and then they re, re uh, silicone it, and then they when it was when they weren't able to do that anymore, they just flipped it all over. Yeah, I think it was five years on each side. Yeah, I, think, yeah, yeah. I think it was five years on each side that they were they were guaranteed yeah. for. So it was a big cost for a ten year rink, except yeah. it was year round. Except there's no outside of the siliconing. There's no maintenance. So right. They right. have to have a cold place. You use it all no year. No water. Round. No yeah, zamboni. Yeah. No nothing. No, yeah, you didn't have to worry about the. We're just cleaning it. Yeah. yeah. And have strong legs to skate because that was a lot harder to skate. <laughs> yeah. So it would have really. They really would have um, taken some a yeah. lot of practice, even for somebody who was. A good when we skater. did that, we had no ventilation except opening the doors. That's the only ventilation they had in there. So health and safety really wasn't really a big, big thing then. <laughs> it was a good thing because we would never done half the products we did. But they made it on weekends only, when there oh. was nobody in the mill. That's all they ran there. Though. Oh, what trash. Yeah, that was, yeah, yeah, there was there was a few products that we did uh, just on the weekends. Uh, yeah. The mill pallets was another one that we used to do just on the weekends because it was such a, a labor-intensive. And what was that? And Curtis right? Curve. Curtis Curve was a, a weekend thing. Uh, uh, bulldoze, or the, the mill pallets were, were uh, a rail system that had the, the, the big... Uh, uh, it was an, they started, you're talking about the one that went to the liquor control board and it all automated. Yeah, yeah, and, and we panels. made the... the uh, inch and a quarter pallets or whatever else that uh, that would slide along on 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 the uh, systems, and and as you, as you took a piece out, the other the other one would slide right in, so you you didn't have to front yourself all the time, oh. in the in the stock rooms. Oh. Liquor control yeah. board come up with uh, we're we're trying a new automated machine where, where there's less handling, so they'd load everything on there and let it go down a conveyor and it just keep going to, to wherever it was going to go to. Oh. And they, we made they're all grooved on the sides. And yeah. They're nice panels. But I don't know what happened to that. I guess there was only one liquor control board. <laughs> and yeah, I think we only had one customer because the fact is it was such such a new uh, product that they're trying that uh, I don't know if it actually went anywhere or whatever. But uh, maybe someone they, else they, took our <laughs> took our yeah, competition might have took us. They come up with all new stuff, eh? Uh, and, and, and that was the nice thing about the, the, the multiply was, or, or uh, uh, the mill itself was, we were in, innovative enough to, to change with the times all the time. That's what kept us going all the time. Is, is right. we just did, we weren't just a one product mill. It was, it was. Yeah, it was multiply. Yeah. Oh, and that's where multiply right. comes from. Hoo -hoo. <laughs> right on. Okay. So we'll continue with part two, just talking about the plywood mill and some of the people that work there and uh, some of the ideas they brought. So you mentioned uh, Henry Snellhart. Yeah, he was uh, he was there when I started in 1966. He was already there. There was him, Atkinson, and uh, Lucien Ferron was another guy. Oh, I remember, remember him. him. He was, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah. He was production right. superintendent there. Lucien and was very active in the town, especially for the centennial year. Yeah. And I remember the plywood mill being involved and Lucien being part of that. Lucien yeah. Brown and uh, Bill Harris. So did Henry come here, do you think, right from Germany? Yep. Yep. And he started from the ground, up, ground yep. floor up. He started from cleanup because we used to talk lots and, and it was funny how he just, he, he, he'd done every job in the mill, just, oh, I guess like almost everybody. <laughs> we just you get tired of the job so you just switched and then went back to the job whether you liked it or not and and but he started right from the bottom of cleanup right to to uh running the mill he was he was actually the manager uh, so again that was that was a testament to his his uh his uh dedication to the mill itself right. uh, and and that was a big part of it was he wanted to make sure that 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 was a mainstay in the beginning and, and it was that's what i'm saying yeah. it was a very big big part and so part of this 
taping or put writing it down is so that later on people know because young people today now have no idea um, what was involved at the plywood mill. How many people do you think it employed in its heyday? 130, I guess, counting the woods and burning. How many? 130. In the um, mill. Oh, no, 150 no, minimum, uh, uh, especially in the summer because we yeah. hire all the students mm -hmm. there. Maybe right. so, so, again, you're looking at probably 150. But the students were a replacement for people that went on holidays. Yeah. Right, right. I, I One time I, there was 130 in there and I was calling some people that worked in the bush. Yeah. Because yeah. there was not many bush cutters. No, it was all contracted up. But yep. There were still a lot of people that contributed the wood supply into the mill. So, I mean, it always has far-reaching effects when, yeah. when you look at all the other people that are producing, providing for the mill. Yep. Yep. Right. There's probably an average of 30 people to shift, and then day shift had more. Right. For some reason, I don't know why they didn't produce anymore. But so over the years, then, did the plywood mill, the building itself, expand? Yep. Yeah, back in the 90s, eh? No, even before. Or 2000? No. No, it wouldn't be 2000. Tom Schreier was working there at that time. When, uh, there was when we first started? No, no, when they expanded it. It expanded from... How the hell did that mill work? Yeah, right it to the sander. It expanded the, to the trim saw. Because the sander used to be down right below the trim saw at one time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Then they expanded that part in the warehouse. That's what they did. Yeah, I remember and the then, warehouse. Yeah, and then when uh, McMillan Bodell came, or uh, not McMillan Bodell, what was our last company there? Well, Warehouser was on the Warehouser house. came in and they gave us the big mill and it was, yeah, it was the big expansion with the, the big new dryers and, and all that. It was, yeah. And then they tried to use the big mill mentality and, and again, that was, it, uh, it was nice because Multiplier used to be a family-oriented place where everybody was family. They'd, if you needed a hand, everybody give everybody a hand. And you had a Multiplier Recreation Association, Yes, right? we did, yeah, 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 where we actually played hockey and, and every, everything went through recreation and it was, it was every, uh, almost everything got funded through recreation, whether it be our, our Christmas parties or, or whatever, it was, yeah. We, we put in so much and the company put in so much. That's yeah, they the matched us for dollar for dollar. Okay. okay. Then when Warehouser sold out to... Who the hell was it now? There was two owners in between there. From the time it burnt till the time it burned down. They're in uh, Hearst. Or oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, I, was, I was off by then. You were off by then? I was off then, yeah. I was off then. So That's probably warehouse, why they had to sell. <laughs> Warehouse Warehouser wasn't the very last one then. No, okay. it was privately owned actually when it burned. Yeah, there was that seven owners or yeah, all the all the staff the locals, people. Eh? Yeah, oh, staff okay. people owned it. Okay. And it was run by what's that French guy's name? And he's over in Fagenhurst or something right now, isn't he? That's where he come from, yeah. But his he's he's uh, an accountant though for one of the reserves down there, or he was. After you left here. So yeah. it, it, names just, I'm not So when you're talking about employees, and I've been trying to line up some ladies to talk, but were women always involved in the plywood <laughs> mill? Oh, yeah. Uh, almost 50%. Yep. 50%. Yep. Wow. And there was woman jobs and there was male jobs. Yeah, male, at one time. Yeah. yeah there and, was, and then all of a sudden it just integrated where there was really... Well, you know, the women, the, once the, the unions got stronger and women started paying attention to what they were able, capable of getting, then they started, because women always wound up working weekends. And uh, the guys that were on five days a week never worked weekends unless they wanted to. But. Mm -hmm. And they were in the minimal paying jobs too, though. Yeah. They, 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 yeah, if you were a machine operator, you got even 10 cents more. It was big bucks back then. It was, you know, like dryer and patcher, and that were mostly all women. Right. Men was unheard of going on a patcher. Oh yeah, <laughs> or dryer. Or <laughs> dryer. You're right because I toured the mill many times, and yeah. you're right. Those men were. But not then doing eventually that. they got to start bumping. They had seniority rates, and they started bumping. A lot of it was because of the huge turnover there. Before the '80s, there was humongous changeovers. Then after the '80s, when the jobs started disappearing, they started staying. Mm. Then they brought in a pension also, so, which made uh, people want to stay, I guess. 
So when you first worked at the mill, there was no pension? No pension at all. Not for a long time. Nobody wanted it. All the young people didn't. They were all single people there, most of them. Yeah, and, and jo jobs are dime a dozen then. You could yeah, just, just say, well, I, next week I'll be working over in Domtar, and next week I'll be working <laughs> in the highways. And you could, it didn't matter where you went, you could always find a job. It was, yeah. And then, like you said, when all, all of a sudden the jobs started drying up, it was like, whoa, <laughs> we need something stable now. When I come by 79, I come back in again. And it was already kind of, st the workforce was kind of staying. They weren't moving. But before then, man, they're changing every day. You guys are. Yeah, because I started in the 70s, and, sure. and uh, most of the guys that started with, with or around me were, we were mainstays there. We, we, we were dedicated enough to, to work there 20 plus years at, uh, before it, uh, it actually shut down. So, and you were talking before about Henry Snellhart brought, did he bring any ideas from Germany with him? I don't think so. Just his brain. Just his brain? Yeah. He was a pretty smart guy. So what, would he, what would he have been involved in in the later years then? Because you said he was running the mill? Yeah, he was the manager. Yeah, he, he had to say on, on what, I guess what product we actually did make and everything else and, and see if there was a market for it. Uh, so we, we tried a lot of stuff, which which didn't work. But but again, it was at least we tried it. Right. You know. So if if it would have took off, then we would we would had another little market that we share the market at least. But uh, a lot of it just did, we just could we weren't capable of doing what what they wanted us to to do for for, for the for the product itself. I can't remember, but was there another plywood mill in this area? No. Nope. It was the only one. Well, Long Lock. Long Lock, yeah. Yeah, Long Lack was the only Would that come after, yeah, because yeah. most of the guys from this place went to Long Lack. Like George Swan, mm -hmm. you remember him? Frank Stocko. Frank Stocko. I remember those people yeah. going yeah. up Frank there. Frank Stocko is still, I see him quite a bit. Comes through gas all the time. Yeah. But the other one, George Swan passed away. Right. I remember those people yeah. going and, up uh, there. Yeah. Right. Nielsen. What was the guy that was in Nipigan all the time? Nelson or Nielsen? Nielsen. You remember him? He was Bent? Drunk. Oh, he was drunk all the time. Pete? Oh! Pete, his brother, Pete. Danny oh, Nielsen. Oh, Danny Nielsen. Danny Nielsen ran the mill. Oh! He, for years. And then he went to Long Lack when they all went to Long Lack. He was one of the, he was the head person in Long Lack. Okay, so it was two plywood mills in this area yeah. then. And then yeah. they had yeah. Hearst and... But see, we were never in any competition because they'd done the eight foot over there. Yeah. We'd done oh. the, the four foot here. Which was a totally different operation compared to what we were. Yeah, all the mills were all mostly eight foot. Yeah, very few four foot mills around. And our our um, our sub flooring was probably our biggest product uh, by far. Yeah, by far. And you're the ones that had the little marks that, on it. Eh? Had the marks every two inches or whatever else, and that was again that was another innovative thing that that multiply did. I don't know who who brainstormed that one, whether it be Henry had part of that or or whatever, but. Uh, once we put that stamp on there, boy, it was <laughs> that was it was uh, a hot commodity then. There was a guy from the states who was salesman. Uh, he used to hang around Elliot all the time. Yeah, I know which one you're talking about. Yeah, uh, I can't think of his name. Anyway, he was a sales. He was from Chicago, so he's all our plywood was sell, sent to or supposedly supposed to be sent to distribution center. And when it wasn't sent to distribution center, the distribution got paid for. For that amount of plywood they're supposed to be storing, and yet it went straight to the customer. Mm -hmm. So he was the one that was trying to get rid of that. But when these bigger like warehouses and them come in, well, they didn't have anything to do it. They wanted to go to their distribution centers because they had their own. So there was money lost there. Hmm. Well, there's a lot of men worked a lot of years though there. Oh yeah. 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 Peter Elliott was there in. Uh, I don't know when he came in the sixties, I think. Yeah. <laughs> he was press help, press helper when he came there. Yeah, there's a lot of. Like really? Trent was one of the first ones. Uh, Udo was one of the first ones. Uh, yeah. Steve Harlick. Steve Harlick was number one when I went there. Oh, yeah. I. So yeah. again, that's that's you know, uh, number two was George Ruth. Yeah. When I was there, so. Alec Legacy. Before that, it, yeah, Alex was number six Alex. when I was there. So. I started there in 1966. First time I worked there. Erwin Nickel was another Erwin. Joel, Joel was actually before way before Erwin. Like Joel said, was there in '66. Yeah. Old Erwin Oya was another one. <laughs> okay. 
So there's a lot of people with a lot of history oh, yeah. with the plywood mill, and I think it's important that we we record Irvin that information. was a big part of that mill because he oh, was yeah. he That's was. Uh, Irvin too. I remember that? when Irvin. they yeah. Irvin yeah. Oya yeah. Yeah. when they were starting to before they went bankrupt. Irvin Oya had left, and he went to Red Rock because Red Rock offered him a lot more money, and he was there, and they were bringing in all these electricians from. I don't know where they were coming from, but supervisors didn't know nothing about making plywood. They just relied on the people that were there. But the electricians had stuff going opposite way. They'd wire something up, it'd take them twice as long to fix something. They did the lathe was down for about 10 days one time because somebody decided to switch the wires around and they had to go and borrow Irwin from Red Rock. It took them two <laughs> days, two days to rewire the whole system again. So there was lots of that. There was lots of people that known. Like Joe Bosch was there for quite a few years. Irwin Nichols, uh, Urban Lewis. Yeah, Urban right. was a long time. Yeah. Not so. Hey, even with Bill Locker, it was it was funny because we used to call him uh, Haywire Bill because if he couldn't get a part for it, he'd haywire mm -hmm. together. <laughs> <laughs> he'd wire it together, yeah. and, and so it would run. Right. That, that, that was the bottom line. As long as it ran, yeah. he was he was happy. He was an in innovative man, though. Very. He very, really was. Bill very. Locker was very innovative, yeah, and I, I think, think that the things was, even outside of the mill that he came up came with. Him, yeah. yeah. I think he, he actually did all the layout for that mill. He, he was one of the first guys there, yeah. He came, they came from Hudson. That's where they come from? Yeah, Hudson. Yeah, Hudson yeah. That's Saskatchewan, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah and, and to see how much the mill changed over the years, yeah, like from, the from, from when we first started to... When I started there, the there end, was everything like, was cut by that 4 by 8 saw. There was no trim saw when I started there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and there was no... Everything fans. was manual. Yeah, there was no fans or nothing. It just... You ate dust. You didn't even have to go for lunch. <laughs> yeah, we'd have to bark the logs, then it'd go up to the to the slasher, and then the slasher would have to measure the logs manually. Would, there was no uh, automatic saw to say, okay, here we, we're sending it right here, and you had to take a, a bar and, and measure one side and mark it, and then take it over on the other side and, and mark it, and then it would you'd have to slash it, and then take, and it would go to, up to the lathe, and then the lathe would, if you get a short log, well, it, it, the the what we called the chucks at the time, couldn't reach it, so the logs would fall. Oh, and then you'd have to manually take those out of there. Yeah. It was, oh yeah, the manual labor was, down there was, right. was in, it was intense manual labor. Right. It was, yeah. And even the jack ladders, when we used to have the jack ladders uh, in the slasher was, uh, in the barker room, we had just two little chains that, that would run up. Well, if the log fell off, and it, would, it would fall off crooked. <laughs> <laughs> then you'd have to take it and try to, and, and if you weren't watching what you were doing, you'd have four or five logs all sitting up like this, like a, like a picket fence. Well, then you've got to try to get them all down. But the weight of the rest of the wood pushing against those things. Too, yeah, because yeah, you had a big pond that was, that was uh, must have been, what, 60 feet, 70 yeah, feet? At least, yeah. Why? It, it was big, big, long pond, so you had 100 and plus logs in there every day. Yeah. One thing about... Uh, Poplar, you to, it, it had to be thawed out first, and it had to be wet. Otherwise, you're, you just chop the shit out of the, you get all that fuzzy thing on it, eh? Yep, yep. So that that pond was pond really was to big, soak, soak yep. wood and, before it and went thaw, in. thaw the wood out also. And even in the Barker and Slash room, uh, because there was so much steam in there, because you had to heat everything, uh, you had to go by sound most of the time, because the fact is, you couldn't see nothing. You could yeah, see maybe two feet in front of your face, so you'd have to listen to see if the log fell off or not. <laughs> <laughs> then they smart enough to start putting heaters all along there. Oh, yeah. There was steam. <laughs> Rihanna was really hot. Oh, hot yeah, that, yeah. What? That's how it ran. Yeah. And I remember going there and seeing, before I started there even, it was uh, Ronald Lagarde, he was slasher guy. They were cutting those things after the chainsaw. There is no no big no, saw. No big saw. Oh yeah. <laughs> and steam, you could hardly see them. And there are some of them are even outside. They're working out. That's when they started building, starting to do some construction there to build a little better setup. Yeah, and then we had clipper operators that would actually uh, they clip out all the defects. Yeah. So 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 we'd have uh, smaller sheets that we would actually get joined together to make one big sheet. Okay. Uh, or, or we'd have to 
feed in reclips that what we call is is reclips for for like when we actually made the, the, the panels itself or the dryer had to, had to feed the, uh, them into the dryer or whatever else but uh, yeah and it was nice because when you got a four foot sheet it was nice because it, it would just you didn't just have to do three little piles but if you had two sometimes two reclips because there was so much junk getting uh, pulled out that you'd have to feed in all these reclips uh -huh. on, on each one and then one full sheet or whatever else but so how many different plies did you make the ninth well you can usually the usually a three our press could could go up to an inch and an eighth That's so our, our hockey pounds were were about right at the max with yeah. 19, 19, plies. 19 plies no we made uh 21 this, this, ply no this was yeah 21 ply eh? yeah but it was tenor veneer yeah it was yeah it was that <laughs> real we made uh yeah it was uh well, uh 062 used to be our our our, our, th our thickness of our veneer when we used to do our hockey panels and it was fairly thin then uh but we used to ship in some uh or no we cut it eh? 033 oh 33 yeah. that so, would happen yeah so what would it would do is as soon as we start feeding it through a dryer it would just buckle oh. up so it just jammed steady, and it was just like a, a real nightmare, a, a, just a total nightmare. Fin, Finland was the only place that could uh, that dried lots of really thin veneer. Yeah, so that's where we actually. 039 and 033, and so a lot of their a lot of the stuff that we use that was that thickness come from somewhere else. Another product we used to do was was spruce, uh, and uh, used to cut really nice and everything else, but once you get it to the dryer. It was, uh, it was just uh, smoke heaven because all the uh, sap and everything used to be on, on those logs and, it, and then all the knots, and there's hundreds and hundreds of knots on each little spruce thing, uh, used to fall off and then catch fire in the dryer. Holy geez, we used to have lots of dryer fire. <laughs> yes, I think I can remember the sirens yeah. going. Yes, we had lot. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, and, and in fact, if, if you've done spruce, uh, for, you'd probably have two fires uh, uh, out of the run in, in the dryer itself. Where you'd have to take it, shut it down, clean it all out, and then restart it all again. <laughs> so of course, fire would be another whole situation to have an interview about well, it, the time of the fire. But that is a time for that right now. So yeah, yeah. Anyway, we want to thank George and uh, Art for lots of information on the plywood mill.